Welcome to Wednesday Q&A, where you all ask the questions and we answer, and we answer joyfully and with our opinions, etc. I am always excited to be with my f- most fabulous friend, amazing physical therapist and stellar human being, Kristen Williams. Thank you, Laura. I share the same sentiments exactly for you. We are so blessed. We are. And we are blessed by this podcast. Thank you all for sending in your questions. We are going to hit the ground running here with a question sent in from our friend, uh, Julie. She says that she has a yoga student that was diagnosed with bursitis and tendonitis in her left hip. She's 33 years old. She had a scan three weeks ago, then had a cortisone shot just after that. The cortisone shot has not given her any relief at all. She has been in a lot of pain, both sitting and standing, has seen a physio on a few occasions, has been given exercises, but unable to do them due to too painful. Her previous exercise included gym work with weights and some cardio. Lately, she has been doing quite a bit of lifting and moving heavy objects around as she has a little business with pots and ornaments. She was advised to ice it, but she has found that heat has given her a small amount of relief. She's going back to her doctor next week for further advice. Would appreciate any suggestions you can give at this stage to help her. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, First Hmm. of all, that is terrible. I mean, especially being young, being active. um, It is not uncommon for us to see that blanket diagnosis of bursitis tendonitis slash ten you know bursitis in the hip um and also be given a cortisone injection now the fact that the cortisone injection did not help is a good indication that the issue may not be there or may not be entirely there because what they do with that injection is if they assume that there's inflammation they go if an injection helps, that's a good sign that that's the issue. So the fact that she's seen really no relief and she cannot seem to do anything that the physiotherapist is giving has me questioning the location being hip bursitis tendonitis. You know, the hip that that to have pain in that location you know, can can be so easily referred, not to mention, she also mentioned her lately picking up this new hobby of lifting and moving, you know, has me wondering if this isn't being referred from her back and she's feeling it in the hip. Now, again, we know, Laura, that the hip and the back are so tightly intertwined that she absolutely could have some hip either primary or secondary issues going on. But the fact that the cortisone injection didn't help, I would bring it back to the back slash pelvis slash slash SI area. Let's move away because that injection didn't help. And I would really want to look to see what are the mechanics she's using when she is doing the lifting that she has been lately doing more of that she didn't used to do. Uh, how is her core strength and stability, you know, and does she have nerve tension signs? You know, what does her spinal mobility look like? Well, we love to look at, you know, what is the, what are the ribs doing? What is her neck doing? You know, what, what is she, the only factor that's changed in her life, it sounds like, is this new ornamental pots. I don't call it hobby, job, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, So we can assume that it's either something she's doing there or the added strain of whatever she's doing there on top of what else she's doing isn't working for her body. And it isn't working, especially on this one side of the body. So, you know, so really diving deep into, you know, what shoes is she wearing when she's doing this? Um, You know, what, how is she standing throughout the day? What is she standing on? I'm picturing this as being like, I know what Julie does in it as part of their business, you know? So are they standing, is she standing on concrete? Oh my all- gosh. This is what right? I'm like. That was my first image. I thought she's probably standing on concrete or uh, some kind of really, you know, surface that isn't going to be 
damaged by water coming through from the pot, whatever it is, or even yeah. if it's just a where, you know, yeah, that's like number one that came to me too. <laughs> right. So, yeah. you know, I would love, and you know, Julie has gone through our lit and, you know, I would, I would tell Julie, Julie, let's look here. This is your friend, you know, take a look. I'm sure Julie has look at her pelvis. You know, does she have an anterior pelvic tilt? You know, does she, how is her hip mobility right to left? Um, Cause she might need, she's probably, like I said, some has developed some secondary issues. Now that hip is probably nice and tight because she doesn't want to move it because it hurts. But you know, we got to get some lumbopelvic work going on. And again, going all the way up into the upper chain where, you know, what is she doing that's beating up? I would argue not the hip, but the SI joint low back area that is referring pain to the hip. What else do you have to add to that, Laura? I, I mean, I just, it's, yeah, it was so interesting because I immediately thought, because this is what we always do. Uh, it's kind of like detective work because... Um, we never want to assume that a diagnosis is that area and it just like popped up out of nowhere and, and, and that everything has to do with that area. Um, so what we have to look at is like the, the things you said, like, oh, something has changed in her life. And that is that she's doing this hobby slash job slash, and that's lifting stuff. And that's, yeah, she's hard that she's on a hard surface. And this is the reason why that's important because the energy coming up is really, really, uh, I, you know, my brother said this once and I love this analogy. It's like putting earmuffs on and you just don't hear as well. And when you put shoes on a concrete floor, it's like that energy is really, really um, muffled. And so you can hang out on ligaments more because you're not getting kind of this 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 absorption upwards that gives you a, that gives you some stimulation for your muscles to want to like hold right there's always a level of resting tone that we have against the forces around us like gravity and so if she's leaning over and all that and she doesn't have that already existing kind of prepped primed tone in her muscles because she's not getting a lot from the floor she's more likely to um not have the best body mechanics. Uh, not even if she has good biomechanics, she's she's using more energy to do that. So any amount of like hanging on her hip that she might have done before is just really exacerbated because she's not getting that responsiveness. Um, everything you said about lumbo pelvic, I think that's great. I would look immediately like Julie. Like, can she lift her knee up like she's marching without moving her pelvis, and then can she extend her hip without moving her pelvis? My gut would be, because that shouldn't bother her lateral hip too much, those two moves, but they're going to tell you how well she's able to mobilize her hip in some, in you know, one of the ranges, but also how well she is going to be able to stabilize her pelvis while her hip is moving. And, you know, we we talked about this in last week's podcast, like you can get away with this for a while and then it just, it's like, it can be like, walking into a wall, boom, you're like, where did this come from? And you put all these different factors in there. Maybe the biomechanics were not great, but she's young and it wasn't really bothering her. And she's doing stuff at the gym, but what is she doing at the gym? Is she just exacerbating that um, lack of good lumbopelvic stability, maybe not great hip range of motion, overly working in her back? Uh, the back is primarily there to transmit force. It's not primarily there to move heavy shit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so it's there's a lot there, but I think you could do a few small movements and just that could tell you a lot. Again, posture is not going to give you the whole picture, but it can really help you identify the things that are possibly um, not organized. At the end of the day, when our body is not organized and not set up in an organized way, we aren't as efficient. And efficiency at some point um, shows up in the form of, you know, pain, pain. ache, pain. all these things. Mm -hmm. And she's saying heat feels better. Well, first of all, ice has now been kind of determined. There's mixed evidence that it does it, that helps at all in terms of acute inflammation. I would never have anybody ice something after a certain like early time anyway, but I always recommend heat because we need more blood flow to an area often. 
And the fact that she says heat does help, that's like telling you that area isn't getting sufficient um, movement, stimulation, circulation, and that heat is giving that sense of like, ooh, the same thing you would get with movement, you know, some circulation and all that. So get back to us, Julie. We'd love to hear how your friend is doing. Um, but it's 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 so it's such a bummer. And here's the other thing, not to get on a pulpit, but when you have an injury, it is so predictable you don't feel like moving a lot because you're guarding your and um, but you have to start moving, but she's going to really focus on stability with her movement, as most people need to do, because we know you can move, but if you're not moving with stability, it's not going to be as helpful. Okay, enough of that. All right, this is from Mara. I hope it's Mara. It could be Mara, but Mara Taylor Hine. She says, "Hey, Laura, thanks so much for your podcast and for de- developing the Lit Method. Doing Lit Daily has been life changing for me." Aww. Yeah. After over a decade of chronic pain. All right, listen to this. Listen to this, people. After a decade, over a decade of chronic pain, I'm no longer in pain. Thank you. Three exclamation marks. Okay. I just got chills. I know. Like, that is like, oh, that's the juice that we want everybody to drink. So question for the podcast. What do you think about mouth tape for sleeping? I sleep with my mouth open, suffer from dry mouth at night, and was thinking of trying it. Thoughts, good, bad. Thank you, Mara. What a great question. This is a very hot thing to do, and I think it's fabulous. But it might not be fabulous for everybody. So that's the thing. Like, if you have, um, you know, a deviated septum, if you have a stuffy nose, then mouth tape is not, it's going to feel kind of like you're suffering (laughs) because you're, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to get in as much um, because you have some kind of restriction or obstruction. But um, nasal breathing is fabulous. And the fact that you feel dry in, in your mouth is telling you something because if you think about the moisture that is present in our nasal passages, it really tells you why na- nasal breathing is so wonderful. It's really what we were born to do in terms of our evolution. But uh, as we went away from um, sub-Saharan areas and went up into different areas in Europe, you know, our uh, our skin got paler and our face got more narrow and our nose got more narrow. And that has not worked for us well, unfortunately, <laughs> um, because our nose, we were really meant to mostly breathe through our nose because of um, the, we have, it's, it's moist. It's, um, it's going to, it's going to take in the air and it, tra- you know, it, it keeps it humid. <laughs> like it's like your own little humidifier versus you come, if you open your mouth and breathe just through your mouth, in any kind of setting, but especially indoors, you're going to start to feel dry because we don't have that same kind of humidifying, beautiful thing we can ha- that can happen in your nose. Um, we have these hairs in our nose that are really great for, t- uh, you know, filtering out any kind of uh, particulates to the area that are an air that are not great to get into um, our breathing. So. It's really, really wonderful. It also makes you more efficient um, with breathing. It's better for you know your heart and all that. So these little cil- the cilia, the hair-like stuff, um, really again are great for trapping stuff before you would go into the lungs. Whereas your mouth, you could, <laughs> if you've ever breathed in a fly, you could literally take in an insect. Right? It's not doing anything to filter out stuff. You're also getting better oxygen uptake, um, and that is. <laughs> There's an there's an exchange of gases that is more efficient in the na- nas- nasal passages than straight through the mouth, so you're just um, more efficient with that oxygen uptake. Unless you have an obstruction where you're not, you know. So, but yeah, absolutely try it out. I have done it. I'm always like inconsistent, unfortunately, with it. If I don't have my tape right next to me, I'll forget about it, and then my husband makes fun of me too. Uh, he's like, "Oh, okay, we're not going to talk anymore." <laughs> I'm like, I'm putting my my mouth tape on. But it is really, really great. And, you know, studies have also shown that nasal breathing, um, and this is outside of just sleep is a great place to do it because the requirements on your muscles are basically nothing, right? 
Uh, there are people who, there are athletes who nasal, who nasal, who tape their uh, mouth, who mouth tape while they're exercising because, and that's, that's hardcore, but it is putting, um, it's using, it's activating the use of your diaphragm more. So there's, it's, un, it's, it's uncomfortable too, because of the managing of the CO2, but uh, people can do it. And, and then you just go back to breathing like, Open your mouth when you need to breathe, especially if you're running up a hill and you're just like, I can't get enough up. I need to like get another way in for the air. So I'm trying to get it in everywhere. But sleep, there's nothing really required. So it's a great place to try this. And you're spending, you know, a good uh, portion of your night, hopefully um, sleeping. At, and there's a lot of other amazing benefits. It's it's said to, you know, with this efficiency of oxygen uptake and um, it's apparently supposed to help if you do have obstruction and but it's minor it is supposed to be able to help actually open up some of the nasal passages if you look at uh, James Nestor's book um, on breathing it talks all about this and he was one of the insane people that like put the duct tape on and was like going on a treadmill and all that but they the the, the, the like the lab results are amazing like in terms of inflammatory markers and all these things that happen from just doing nasal breathing it always makes people who do have nose issues feel really bummed out, though, because they can't kind of partake in the same way. But I think they could do it when they're not sleeping and just very like sitting and reading a book. But they're more conscious of like it's, you know, if it feels uncomfortable, they can take the tape off. Well, so like anyway. you answered that so beautifully. I think the only thing I would add is that the very last thing you said at the end, because I do think that there is an element to mouth breathing that is just a habit and people don't realize they're doing it and they can close their mouth and breathe. They just don't. Mm -hmm. So if you can't do it at night, try it during the day. Um, because I mean, I will say I could be, I can sit up and be totally fine. And then I lie down and my sinus goes, go, they go, mm -hmm. and then yeah. You, like, let's talk I about like, if you have any kind of, yeah. Any extra, kind of nasal. Yeah. yeah. So like my allergies are bad sometimes in order to not, you know, have to breathe through my mouth or because my nose is so stuffed, I have to stay upright, you know, yeah. because it's just a drainage issue. So, but otherwise I know I do. I think that mouth breathing is habitual and it, it's very habitual. Habit. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it was a game changer. I used to be a big mouth breather when I was younger. And I mean, I almost never mouth breathe except for when I'm exercising. I cannot imagine putting tape like that is next level. But that is next level. You answer that from soup to nuts. Great job. Well, thank you. It's because I've done it, my own deep dive into it. And I, um, you know, when, like a lot of times you hear about in yoga, you should only breathe through your nose. And it's like that isn't giving the whole picture. It's really <clears throat> nasal breathing is superior. Um, but that doesn't mean you should never open your mouth. You should like, then people are like, we, sh we shouldn't exhale out through your mouth. Of course you should. Like just, that's a release. There's more, it's not just about like the perfection of like right. the efficiency of breathing. It's also like using the exhale as a release, a release of, you know, we can visualize like stress going away with that. So um, I think that it has not been really articulated well in yoga. Why? And why you should try it. It doesn't mean that you're like mm, firmly holding your lips together, but notice if you're like, because there's jaw stuff, there's, uh, again, it's inefficiency. You might be panting, you might be using, you know, again, more of your chest and not getting down into the diaphragm. So you could try it in yoga practice as well. Uh, maybe just becoming more aware of, of not opening your mouth, which I think, you know, many of our lip practitioners do. And then we are sitting there talking a lot during it, but uh, we're we're getting our oxygen more through our nose when we're talking. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so let's see. We had uh, a, a question come in from one of our lit yoga teachers. Speaking of teaching, um, Kim, she says, "Hi, Kristen. I have a question for the podcast. Can you speak to why we don't practice traditional seated forward folds in the lit method, and what are the more optimal ways to achieve similar benefits of seated folds?" As always, thank you for all the awesome information you and Laura share on the podcast. And, you know, I will kind of dive in to this where there's the part of me that questions what the benefits of the seated forward fold are, period, point blank, you know. Period. Um, 
and I am, I am, I struggle to find, to, to think of them. You know, the, the, the only time that I have found that bending your knees doesn't work for someone is if they don't have good hip mobility. So then when people try to hinge at the hips, I have seen instances where if they don't have good hip mobility or if they don't have good pelvic neutrality, if you if you will, then they develop hip issues from that that hip hinging, um, which is so, you know, knowing that there's nothing wrong with flexing at the spine, right? I mean, it's it's a very mobile structure. It's it's um it's meant to move. But when we look at what the quasi benefits of a seated forward fold are, to me, they're limited. I mean, they're limited in, I mean, so yes, we could argue that it's a nice back stretch. You know, I will say after we go, kind of go back, we had a, a running question last week. You know, when I run my, the way I run, my hips will tighten up and my back will tighten up. That is probably, that is the only time when I'm done with a long run and my back is just really tight that I will fold forward in a non-lit way because I know I want to stretch. I want to traction the spine because I'm tight. The problem with doing that in a yoga practice is it's repetitive and it's very passive. So you've got gravity pushing down pushing, we'll just say, but gravity affecting the weight of the trunk over. And there's very little core engagement when people do it. So to what end? Yeah. I always ask no matter what I'm doing, and it's even with the lit method, you know, there are certain things that are traditional lit movements that at times I don't do because of a certain way I'm feeling. Um, like I, you know, like if my hip's bothering me, then, you know, if I'm impinging or whatever, I'm, I'm not going to do a deep hip hinge. So, you know, I'm struggling to find any, like, su- whatever the supposed benefits of a forward fold, seated forward fold, a forward fold of any type are. Um, Lara, do, can you speak to more of what may be a traditional, because I've only done lit. Yeah, she's probably training. thinking I of like. So Pashimottanasana, this is a like the classic forward fold where your legs are straight out and you like lean over and, you know, they don't say the goal is to get your nose down to your legs, but that is kind of the implied. And maybe in actually in, in some class, in some lineages, they actually do say that. Um, and so the my I, I said this the other day in our teacher training call and you know, it is said a lot that the body, like in movement practitioners, will will say that learning to move the body well, consciously, because many people are, have just figured out after they got up bipedal, they just kind of moved and they weren't thinking about how they were moving. And the, that's where we're so smart. We will execute movement. But if you are trying to be consistent with your understanding of the body, then it's inconsistent to do something that doesn't make sense, right? And so this is like sometimes we'll say like dog training is a lot like training good movement is that you need to be consistent because if you're not consistent, your brain's not going to get the message like this is actually the pathway I want to do because it's going to be better for my joints. It's going to be better for my breath. It's going to be better for, you know, just my my engagement my, of my you know, core to, to support me. So if, if somebody were to say, well, you know what, how about, because I know I used to take classes 25 years ago and we did, you know, always 15 minutes at the end of every class you're on the ground. And I was like, this is like rolling around. I feel like they're, they're doing this to take up time. I kind of really wondered. And, it would, and I remember one male teacher in particular said to me, we're going to be here for five minutes. This was a seated forward fold, which is Pashimachanasa. This is a surrender. You need to surrender. And I thought, fuck you. (laughs) I was like, what are you talking? Why do I need to surrender? I'm cool. Like I'm, and I, I, and that's when I, that even before I started questioning the biomechanics, 
I was like, why is somebody telling me to stay in this position and deal with the discomfort of it or whatever and surrender? So that was my like first like, this this is not cool. A, this kind of sage on the stage telling me what I need to be doing. So that's lesson number one. You're, there's The benefit is not mental and it's not physical and it's not fossil. It's nothing. And here's why. Kristen is standing on her feet and folding over and she's flexing her spine. Great. Getting a nice back fascial stretch. But she's getting something up from the floor that is ultimately offering some protection because it's weight bearing, ground reaction force going up. She's got something that she's pulling from. When you're sitting down, and people are like, oh, well, your sit bones. No, your sit bones aren't doing anything. They're not providing any support. They're poor little things. That's the whole problem with sitting like I am right now. My sit bones aren't doing anything. So everything around it has to like grab, right? And so I'm hinging with the hope that I'm opening up my back and my hamstrings. Well, most people, A, don't need to open up their hamstrings like that ever. Hypermobile people should never do that because they're only going to get floppier and less information into the brain. But it just goes down to this. When you have so much going on in your life and you give yourself 30 minutes to move on the mat, I want every moment to have an impact on many aspects of your life. Functionally, how you feel, re rewiring perhaps, better movement, and that is not going to do it. It's not going to do it, and it if anything, it could undo some really good stuff. And hey, if you've ever had a proximal hamstring tear, that's a good way of doing it. <laughs> um, you're loading your trunk over your legs and your poor legs aren't weight bearing. You know, they don't have any. So they might push down into the floor, but no, that's not great. Uh, just stop doing it. It's really not a good idea. There's so many ways. Sit on the floor cross-legged. You're going to get your pelvic stability. You're going to get hip mobility. You're going to get an upright spine. 90% of the people need to work on that. They don't need to fold forward, probably from their back, without great core stability. And there will not be any carryover. This is big. We talk about this in physical therapy all the time. And this is, I think, what sets lit apart. We are not just about what you're doing 30 minutes on the mat. We want that to help you live better, move better, breathe better, function better, have more energy, sleep better for decades. So what is going to be the fuel for that? Not folding over like you're some kind of floppy puppet. Uh, there, there's nothing, spiritual, mental, physical, anything that's going to gain from that. There's my opinion. Take it or leave it. <laughs> I mean, that, well, I mean, literally... I'm just sitting here going like in my head, amen. I mean, like when you said, if you have 30 minutes to move, why the hell would you do something that didn't have a goal? And that, my friends, is what sets lit apart. That's yeah. what, as I bought it and sold it years ago. I mean, I, you know, bought it and now yeah. I'm selling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Because, You're like, I'm going to be that. I'm going to do that. Because, yes. Yeah. Like, it is intentional. It is planned. It is, there's a why and a how. And it's not just because you're supposed to surrender. Like, I almost threw up on my mouth. Oh, my gosh. I can't, I remember feeling like so icky. offended. And yeah. yes, because yeah. I just felt like, I don't, why do I want to surrender? I'm not, I'm, you know, there's types of surrender, I guess, to like, okay, we aren't in charge of everything. That's not surrender. I want to be an active participant in life. Surrendering my body and just being okay with discomfort, that's a great thing to tell people who are suffering. Good job. And by the way, when you said 30 minutes, there's there should be a goal. When Sometimes people are like, goal? No, we need goals. We are walking around numbed out snoozed out and not operating at our highest potential. So we need to tap into that. Be uh -huh. And it's not our fault, by the way. This is the world. We have so much distraction, 
so much messaging. We better have a goal for ourselves that I want to be more present. I want to take in life. I want to enjoy it. I want to feel energy. I want to be able to decide what to say yes to, what to say no to. That's a goal that you get when you have a better brain, body, mind, spirit connection. And that's what happens when you have a goal of how you're moving to improve how you feel. And a passive move like seated forward fold has none of that. No, it doesn't. It's a waste of time at the at the very you know, best. At the yeah. very best. <laughs> okay. So we don't have strong opinions about this or anything. <laughs> I just really want to inform people because, you know, so many people, and hopefully it's less so now, they emulate these bendy people. And by the way, that's probably easy for them. It's no big deal. There is nothing inherently uh, valuable or applaudable about that. It's easy for them. And they shouldn't be doing it because it is easy for them. Because if if, if they're lax, they shouldn't be doing it. Okay. Okay. We love you all. This is why we're so passionate. It's not like I'm trying to, um, you know, we're just really trying to teach people about body mechanics and how to live for many, many, many decades, believing that you can move better in the year coming than you did in the year that just passed. It is true and it is possible. That is what, that's what we're singing about. So. It's for your benefit. <laughs> so anyway, good. send okay. us your questions and you'll, again, take our response, laugh at it, ignore it, or, you know, write back about it. But we're just here giving you coming from, you know, our background and whatnot. Uh, but you can write us at support at lityoga.com. You can write any question. There's nothing off the table. And if you do not want us to mention your name, just say, please keep me anonymous. And we're happy to make that happen. You can also find us on social media. You can find Laura at Laura.Hyman. I'm at KB Williams 99. And you can also just write our Redefining Yoga podcast. Drop us a DM there and we will get your questions answered as soon as possible. Don't forget to rate and review us as well. And for anybody who's listening who hasn't joined Lit Daily, why don't you join and see what all the 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 fuss is about, man? Because We're going to teach you. That's our big thing. We're going to educate you about your body because we were not educated, most of us, unless you went to PT school for years or even medical school. That doesn't count. All right, because they're taught about usually certain systems and then whatever they're not practicing, they don't necessarily remember. But we were taught this and we want to share it because everybody has a body and everybody has a body for their life. It's the one thing that's going to be with you all the way through. So let's take care of it. And know, as always, we're pulling for you. We're pulling for you.